Good afternoon uh, to each and everybody of uh, you joining uh, us, uh, the Timber Design Society today. My name is Namir Amsu, member of the Timber Design Society Management uh, Committee. We welcome TDS, CSOC and EGP Engineering General Practitioners members joining us online today in the fourth webinar of the TDS webinar series 2021. TD TDS warmly uh, welcomes new members to join the society. You can apply online and complete the membership form on timberdesign.org.nz. TDS have uploaded all previous recordings to its uh, website. Please uh, feel uh, free to browse uh, for TDS Webinar Series 21-2021 webpage and stay tuned for new webinar recordings in the future. TDS is pleased to announce its uh, next confirmed webinars. The fifth one uh, will be on the 12th of August by Andrew Dumba to present a Kiwi in Canada mass timber case studies and timber design learnings. And the sixth one in the series will be on the 2nd of September by Dr. Ashkan uh, Hashimi to talk on seismic resilient mass timber structures, uh, the role of resilient connections. I've just put in the chat room uh, a, a page on, on your right hand side, uh, a TDS journal uh, survey, if you could uh, feel relaxed to help or assist TDS to fill in this uh, survey uh, form. It's online. So stay tuned for uh, TDS future webinars and events. Today we have the fourth TDS webinar series in 2021 by uh, Lisa Oliver of Holmes Consulting talking on an introduction to mass timber post and beam structures. Few housekeeping uh, remarks. Lisa will talk for 40 to 45 minutes. Then we'll have questions and answers from the audience for around 15 minutes before the hour when everybody returns back uh, to work. This presentation is recorded and will be kindly made available by NG New Zealand very soon. Lisa Oliver is a project director with Holmes Consulting LP and vice president of the Timber Design Society. She is a chartered professional engineer and has a master's degree from the University of Canterbury. Lisa has a broad range of structural design and assessment experience in New Zealand and in the Netherlands. Lisa design experience with timber includes design projects such as the Motad Aviation Display Hall. She recently co-authored the design guide and the post and beam timber connection uh, as well. Currently based in Christchurch, Lisa is involved in the sustainability and timber aspects across many projects. Once the presentation is finished, we will have questions and answer answers session you may like the published questions to determine which goes first in the queue. Thank you very much once again, and please allow me to welcome Lisa Oliver. <laughs> 
Lisa, thank you. Kiora, thank you for the introduction, Namir, and thank you all for tuning in today. As I said, I'm Lisa Oliver. I'm a structural engineer and project director for Homes Consulting. I've always had an interest in timber, and I have been fortunate to be involved, have been involved with a few projects. Timber projects look great. They're low in body carbon, and as a structural engineer, I love how our details are often on display. But until recently, mass timber buildings have been rare in New Zealand. Most of us live in timber framed houses, but timber is not competed with steel and concrete in the commercial scale buildings. I'm excited to see this changing. And before I get into the body of my presentation on mass timber post and beam construction, I want to touch on some of the reasons why we need to see more and more timber in New Zealand buildings. Using timber for the primary structure is a great way to reduce embodied carbon in buildings and can help us reduce our embodied em our carbon emissions. In 2019, the New Zealand government introduced the Zero Carbon Bill, which sets a goal for transitioning to a, zero, a net zero emissions economy by 2050. To lead by example, in 2020, the government introduced the Carbon Neutral Government Programme that requires public sector agencies to measure and publicly report their emissions. Government agencies must set reduction targets and offset any emissions they don't cut by 2025. So this all flows down to the building and construction sector. In 2018, a think step report estimated that building and construction in New Zealand contributes to around 20% of our gross greenhouse emissions. So we need to play our part in reducing these. MB's Building for Climate Change program has been set up to help make this change. The Building for Climate Change frameworks are still in development, but they'll likely require embodied carbon reporting requirements and caps, which new building projects must meet as part of securing a building consent or code of compliance. And just last month, a procurement a guide for government agencies was released on reducing carbon emissions in building and construction. Some of you might have seen the media where the Honourable Stuart Nash said that what this meant was that if you're building a building for the state sector or the state sector is building a building itself, then it has to be built out of wood. Now the procurement guide wording is not quite so definitive but it is now mandatory for government agencies planning new buildings with a value over 9 million to demonstrate they're taking positive steps to reduce carbon emissions. They must prepare a carbon brief, assess the, the carbon emissions of design options and report these. And if they choose a design that is not the lowest possible carbon option to meet their project brief, they must identify the reason for this and have the decision signed off by the chief executive. So, so we all know timber is a great way to achieve low embodied carbon. So it makes sense to use timber to meet the, these objectives. And the government is doing just that. They're currently developing plans for several new buildings at parliament. The largest, a six story office block has been announced as a timber building and the principles of environmental sustainable design and the use of New Zealand made materials will also apply to the other two. But how can we make commercial scale buildings out of timber? Especially here in New Zealand, where we need to design for earthquakes. This is where I think the integration of mass timber post and beam systems will become more mainstream. By the end of this presentation, I want you to have an understanding of what is possible with mass timber post and beam construction and where to go to find more information. I want you to be excited about mass timber and actively looking for opportunities to use post and beam in your next project. So what do I mean by post and beam? Very simply, post and beam construction refers to a system where a building's vertical support 
is built of beams and columns rather than walls. This allows for large open and flexible spaces to be created, which are often desired for commercial buildings. This is nothing new. Post and beam construction has been used for hundreds of years, and many of these buildings are still in use. For instance, the Kauri Timber Building in Auckland on Fanshawe Street, which was originally on the shoreline and built to serve the thriving logging industry. Or the Wellington Museum on Queen's Wharf in Wellington, which was originally a Wellington Harbour Board building. And now with the development of engineered wood products and connections, we can do even more with timber than we have ever before. As an example, the tallest full timber building in the world currently is the 18-storey Moostrinner building in Norway. The gravity and lateral systems are all timber. It contains apartments, a hotel and offices. Now look at the size of those members. Closer to home is the 10 storey um, 25 King Street building in Brisbane. Now, these are currently the exceptions, but there are many post and beam projects around the world in the three to six storey range. In New Zealand, as long as you're in compliance with the building code, there is no specific limit to the, size, to the height or size of timber structures. However, practical limits um, due to the size of structural elements, cost, fire and size, seismic performance, and even wind sensitivity will probably mean we don't push the height limits too high. As Namir mentioned last year, I co-authored the NZ Wood Design Guide on Post and Beam Timber Construction with Ben White, a colleague of mine here at Homes. It is a high level guide providing an introduction to post and beam timber construction within, in a New Zealand context. It includes case studies, span tables, worked examples, and examples of connections that can be used for post and beam construction. If you haven't come across the NZ Wood suite of design guides before, I recommend you check them out. They're free to download and you can find links to them from the Timber Design Society website. Now, I can't cover everything in the guide today, so I'll focus on the post and beam system. For instance, different possible configurations, materials and components for a gravity only frame. Meeting the performance requirements, such as designing for fire, vibration and acoustics and also how to realise the benefits of using timber during construction. So ideas around designing for speed of assembly and managing moisture movement. Okay, the post and beam system. The basics. Today, I am just going to be talking about the gravity system. So floors, beams and columns. These can be used in conjunction with timber lateral load resisting systems like CRT shear walls or timber braces, but often it's more efficient to use steel diagonal braces or concrete shear walls. If your aim is to reduce embodied carbon, then simply substituting the floors and beams with timber will make a huge difference. Materials. The most common type of engineered timber used for mass timber beams and columns are LVL, laminated veneer lumber, and glue, lam, glue laminated timber lumber. LVL is manufactured from thin wood veneer elements which are glued together with their grain direction parallel to the main axis of the member. It is manufactured in 1.2 meter wide panels and then cut to size. Glue lamb consists of timber boards laminated together parallel to the length of the member to create the required cross section. LVL has a higher strength to stiffness ratio compared to glue lamb, but glue lamb is often preferred aesthetically if members are to be exposed. Both materials come in standard grades and standard widths and depths for smaller sized members, 
but for the scale of project that we're talking about today, bespoke members will likely need to be manufactured. It is important to talk to the manufacturers early in the design process to determine the most cost effective member sizes and to determine what is possible. For floors, two common systems are solid timber flooring, such as CLT, cross laminated timber panels, or more traditional joisted floor systems that use a thin sheathing like plywood. CLT is constructed of several layers of timber boards stacked at right angles and glued together on their wide faces. It is typically made with an odd number of laminations, normally three to seven, and the outer layers run, pa run parallel to the major span direction. In joisted systems, the joist can, joists can be sawn in timber, engin engineered beams, or even trusses. These systems can also be prefabricated into cassettes to allow for faster site installation and even composite action between the joist and the sheathing. Joisted systems will often be more materially efficient than solid CLT floors, but the overall floor depth will be more. The choice of floor system can be influenced by a number of factors, such as span, aesthetics, services integration, as well as fire and acoustic considerations. Typically, floor spans for CLT are three to six metres. The deeper joisted cassette systems typically span five to nine metres. Determining the grid spacing is a critical design factor for mass timber buildings and needs to be done early in the design process with input from the whole design team. There is no best grid, but it is recommended that a close grid of columns is considered first, such as five metres by five metres or five metres by six metres. The overall floor depth is dependent on the grid spacing and is often deeper for timber buildings than post and beam construction using other materials. As the beams, as the beam spans increase, serviceability criteria such as vibration starts to govern the design and connections between members become more complex. Although it is possible to achieve something like a nine meter by nine meter grid, this will significantly increase the cost and design complexity. The image here is the T3 building in Minneapolis, USA. It's a six story building with a, a six by 7.5 meter typical grid spacing. The floor GLT in this instance is spanning six meters with the beams that are coming out of the page spanning 7.5. There are numerous possible configurations for the layout of post and beam structures, but two common ones are one-way spanning beam systems and two-way beam systems. So the top image is a one-way spanning beam system. These are materially efficient when the span of the floor in one direction is maximised. It can also be advantageous for the reticulation of services. Two-way spanning beam systems are often chosen to provide fewer columns or shorter floor spans, especially if mass timber CLT floor, flooring is to be used. In the design guide, we provide approximate member sizes for several different configurations to give you a feel for the beam depths required. In the examples, a 6 by 6 metre grid has a structural floor depth between 600 and 900 millimetres. So you can see why it's important to consider this early. The last point I want to make in the systems section is that you can also mix and match timber elements with other materials. On the left here is Wynn William House in Christchurch that uses timber beams with concrete columns and a com floor floor. <clears throat> On the right is the Microsoft campus in California that uses timber floors and columns but steel beams. There are so many possibilities and a way to meet every project brief. <clears throat> So moving on to performance requirements. As I mentioned before, I can't 
mention everything in this webinar. <clears throat> so I've chosen just to touch on vibration, acoustics and fire. It's, these are three aspects where the performance is different for most timber structures than for other materials. Deflections and vibration often govern the design of timber beam and floor systems, particularly um, when considering long spans. The most common source of vibration is from footfall and can be a significant source of annoyance to building occupants. There are simple deflection, frequency and stiffness checks that can be completed early in the design and we provide some of these in the design guide. Remember to check the system and not just the individual elements in isolation. For instance, CLT span tables will often show a limiting vibration span, but this considers the floor is supported by rigid supports, not flexible beams. Two-way spanning systems or cantilevers add more complexity. It is important to involve the client in decisions regarding the level of vibration response targeted as it can have a significant impact on cost and sizing of elements. It is worth considering creating a dynamic model to capture the floor response. And I recommend the recently published Woodworks Mass Timber Floor Vibration Guide for more information. Timber's high strength to density ratio makes it an ideal structural material However, this ratio can lead to less desirable sound insulation performance between adjacent spaces. The New Zealand Building Code specifies the acoustic performance required for residential intertenancy walls and floors, but for other building types, acoustic performance is selected by the building owner or developer. So again, it's important to get them involved in these decisions. Um, because although acoustic treatment is not required, occupants will have an expectation of acoustic performance based on what they're used to, um, like a, tim a concrete floor. And to achieve a similar level of performance, acoustic treatment will be required. It is recommended that early input from an acoustic consultant is sought to set design criteria and assist with the design. There are many options to achieve the desired acoustic rating, like adding acoustic screeds, floating floors and or ceilings are all options. The choice of treatment will impact the floor weight and thickness, so should be allowed for early in the design. The New Zealand Wood, the NZ Wood Design Guide on Acoustics has been put together by Grant Ems, Sean King and Malcolm Dunn of Marshall Day Acoustics and covers the performance of timber floors and walls in more detail. Fire. I'll try not to go into this in too much detail um, because if you missed it, you can go and find Andy Buchanan's webinar from back in May. Um, and there's also lots more information in the NZ Wood Design Guide, Design for Fire Safety, also authored by Andy. Firstly, though, it is important to remember that timber buildings, whether constructed of light timber or mass timber, can be designed to provide a similar performance to other construction materials. Techniques to achieve the desired fire resistance rating including, include covering the timber with protective plasterboards such as byline jib, or designing timber elements, assuming a sacrificial layer of timber. This is where the surface charring of the wood allows an insulating layer to form that provides some protection to the underlying timber. The amount of char can generally be calculated for engineering tim engineered timber the same way as solid timber, but for CLT, guidance should be sought from the manufacturer. Char affected sections must be checked to ensure there'll be sufficient strength remaining by the reduced section to withstand loads after the fire event. But with large mass timber members, this is not typically the critical load case. More challenging is protecting the connections between members. Steel connectors exposed to fire will heat up and cause the adjacent timber to lose strength and cause additional charring. 
Therefore, all components required under the fire load case should be protected with insulating material. One way to do this is to conceal the connections within the char layer, like the top image, um, by plugging bolt holes. In addition to fire resistance ratings, surface finishes to control the early spread of fire and production of smoke in certain types of buildings also require designers' attention. For post and beam construction, the heavy beams and columns are typically excluded from these requirements. However, exposed timber panels, such as on the underside of floors and ceiling systems, must be considered in areas such as exit ways and importance level four buildings. The third and final section of what I'm going to cover today is about realising the construction benefits of using timber. Rapid construction on site is one of the big advantages of timber post and beam construction. However, to achieve this, the construction must be carefully planned and designed for. When done well, timber post and beam buildings using prefabrication can have very successful construction programs and can be used on tight sites with tight, with where tight site constraints exist. There are also quality and health safe and health quality and health and safety benefits um, to using timber. Mass timber construction sites are cleaner, quieter, require fewer construction workers and typically require fewer vehicle movements. The topics I'm going to touch on in this section are erection and sequencing, tolerance and weather protection. Again, if any of this sparks your interest and you want to know more, as well as a summary in the post and beam guide, there's also an NZ Woods design guide specifically on construction guidance for timber buildings by Thomas Kastner. When you're deciding on your floor system or your beams and columns, you need to be thinking about how they'll fit together on site. Does it make sense to have continuous floor panels that span across the beams and can be dropped straight into place? This will provide a quick install and easy connections, but will mean comprom compromising on the overall floor depth. Are the columns going to be spliced every level? And if so, where? at the floor level or mid-height? Or are the columns going to be continuous over several levels? Crane time is an important factor on construction sites with significant associated costs. So reducing the number of parts and therefore lifts will reduce crane time. The type of connections used can also have a huge influence on how easily things go together on site. It's important to Consider the time required before the part can be unclipped from the crane, the ease of installation on site and access to do so. Sequencing also needs to be considered when designing connections. Does the detail like a lap joint between floor panels mean one panel needs to be placed before another? Or does the connection chosen mean temporary propping will be required? Another consideration might be how much can be pre-assembled prior to lifting. Timber is a reasonably lightweight material, so large assemblies may be able to be assembled on the ground and lifted into place, as was done here on the Beatrice Tinsley building at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. Here you can see a full four-storey frame being lifted into place. On to tolerance. Although CNC machining can mean structural timber elements can be fabricated very accurately, tolerance for constructability must still be considered. Remember, we are often still connecting into concrete foundations. Um, think about this when designing connections. Bearing type connections, like those shown here, often do provide some inherent tolerance. Whereas often large proprietary pre-designed hangers can have as low as two millimetres tolerance and need to be installed square 
these images of the of these images are of the McGant type connector from NAP. Another important consideration when it comes to tolerance is the impact of shrinkage and expansion of wood elements during construction. Timber will expand or contract much more perpendicular to grain than parallel to grain due to changes in moisture contact. Exposed end grains of timber, el timber elements are particularly susceptible to moisture movement. Local swelling at the end of a column while exposed during construction could be enough to cause tolerance issues when placing beams that sit snug between them. In some instances, swelling can even fracture screws installed perpendicular to grain, which brings me on to weather protection. It is important for timber projects to have a moisture management plan to limit the impact of moisture on site. Two basic concepts can be used. First, avoid prolonged water exposure. This can be achieved through protection, such as wrapping timber elements, but care must be, made, must be taken to assure that damaged wrapping does not, is not actually trapping moisture in rather than keeping it out. Avoiding prolonged water exposure also involves having a strategy to remove water from the structure after rainfall, such as sweeping pooled water off exposed timber slabs. The second part of moisture control on site is ensuring that timber is allowed to dry out and release moisture prior to enclosure. Moisture management doesn't need to be complicated. This image is from the Clearwater Keys apartment complex. This is a five story mass timber building currently under construction at a golf resort north of Christchurch. You can see the end grain of the columns have been protected by plastic rubbish bags. And I also understand that some of the timber for this project was on site for the whole COVID lockdown, but protection and ventilation ensure that moisture was managed. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. As I've mentioned several times during the presentation, if you want to know more, please look up the NZ Wood Design Guides. They're a great place to start and there are currently 14 freely available for download. So I hope you've learned something new and are excited about using Mess Timber Post and Beam on your projects. Now, Miki Nui, does anyone have any questions? Uh, thank you, Lisa. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, thorough uh, talk. Uh, that was really a very good one. Uh, we have a uh, few questions, uh, although I'm not able to see the questions, but Rebecca is helping me to send them through to me. Uh, first one, uh, how can uh, the long term creep effects in uh, multi-story buildings be controlled? Good question. Um, so creep is typically more significant when the elements are la um, loaded perpendicular to the grain in parallel. So the first step is to um, detail connections in such a way that you're not loading um, timber perpendicular to the grain. So having continuous columns rather than a column that stops and starts um, each side of a beam. Um, <clears throat> but there is still some creep parallel to grain. So you really just have to calculate what it is and ensure that your design will accommodate that. Typically, if your whole structure is timber and all the columns are loaded to a similar um, similar ratio, then everything will creep at the same amount and it's not an issue. Um, where you might want to um, put a bit more thought into it, though, is if you have, um, a, say, a concrete lift core, 
adjacent to a timber column and then that couple of mills um, creep over that may develop might be a bit more noticeable but it's really just a, a case of calculating what it is and there are methods to do that um, and normally it, it doesn't cause too many issues. Okay, uh, second question saying, while I, I understand that uh, the cost of mass timber may come down as it becomes more popular, how does it compare with steel or concrete construction? This is a very difficult um, question to answer, especially at the moment when construction materials, all the con construction materials, um, the pricing for all construction materials is in such flux because of COVID and the supply and demand issues we're having. But there have been several studies done reasonably recently, um, some, some performed by Nayla Love and some um, performed as part of the Clearwater Keys project, but have shown that really there's not a big difference um, between the cost of timber structure and a steel or a concrete structure when you um, factor in the benefit of a shorter construction period. Um, I think the I think Naylor Love data talks about perhaps a 3% um, cost premium on the timber structure, um, whereas the Clearwater Keys um, study showed that it was almost parity. And as mentioned in the question, as we become more familiar with using timber, as we standardise how we use it, um, you know, we're not having to reinvent the wheel every time with a new connection, those prices for timber will come down. Uh, the third question saying, since you have talked about carbon emissions as an advantage for timber, for context, may you Comment on uh, the life cycle, supply chain, environmental impacts of the adhesives used in LVL or glue lamb timber, plus non -re recyclability of uh, uh, said glue, glued plus treated timber at the end of uh, the structures, design life. Another complex topic. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> I, I'm not an expert in life cycle assessment. Uh, however, I can break this down in a few ways. First is, um, there are different bounds that a life cycle assessment can look at. Um, cradle to gate or cradle to um, grave. Now, even if you're just looking at um, a timber building uh, from construction and through its operating life, and you're not including the sequestered carbon in the timber, the energy and therefore embodied carbon required to create those timber elements and construct the building are still less than the equivalent for steel and concrete buildings. When you add in the benefit of embodied carbon, then the timber um, building can actually have a negative impact. By not um, considering the embodied carbon, uh, sorry, the sequestered carbon, it makes that end of life um, discussion uh, easier and more compar comparable between the, the three different materials. Because if you are counting for that sequestered carbon, then you would have to assume that if the building 
um, was set to landfill at the end of its useful life, then that sequestered carbon, carbon would be released back into the atmosphere. The end of a building's life is a, something that's very difficult to predict, whether it is timber, steel or concrete. And yes, there are ways to recycle concrete and steel elements. Um, and recycle might not be quite the right word for reusing a timber, the elements from a timber building. Um, and these mass timber elements, if they are treated and they have all this glue in them, won't necessarily um, just decompose uh, in a landfill. However, there will be opportunities to reuse um, the whole the whole element, um, especially these big pieces of mass timber. They might be able to be cut down into smaller pieces and used again. Um, I quite like uh, Michael Green is quite a famous architect of mass timber buildings, and I've heard him before say, you know, mass timber like this never gets thrown away. You look at the old um, churches and things, people reuse all that timber. So why should we think that anything different is going to happen in the future? As for the specifics of life cycle assessment of the glues and resins, I, I don't have the details on that. OK, uh, next uh, saying, can you comment about uh, penetrations needed through uh, timber beams? What are the limitations around this? Well, let me refer you to another of the NZ Wood Design Guides on Beam Reinforcement and Penetrations uh, by Daniel Moroda. Now, he did a webinar on this topic a couple of months ago, so you can go back and look at that. But in the design guide, there's really clear advice on what kind of penetrations you can put through a beam without using any reinforcement. Um, and by reinforcement, I mean, uh, say, threaded screws, perpendicular, um, to the grain or epoxy doweled rods or um, plywood applied to the face of the member. Um, so with those reinforcing measures,